Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second St. John's Northwestern Academy's Spotlight Series uh, our, with our featured guest, Mr. Mike McClure from the class of 1960. Mike, how are you doing tonight? Very good, Steve. Thank you. Awesome. Good to awesome. be with you. Well, we are, we're, we're excited. Folks, you, have, you are in for a real treat tonight. Um, in, in preparation for this particular spotlight, um, I've gotten to know Mike a little bit over the last month or so, a little bit more than I have had in, in recent, uh, recent years. And uh, we've just had a great time uh, conversing about his experiences. And so as we unfold this whole thing, uh, I, I am confident you are going to enjoy the conversation we're going to have tonight. So uh, without further ado, uh, Mike, I'd, I'd like to kick things off uh, initially. Um, just kind of want to list some of your your accomplishments and, and a little bit of your history here. And then we're going to I'm going to jump into some questions and, and we'll, we'll take this thing off uh, from there. Okay. Um, so uh, you're the class St. John's Military Academy, Academy class of 1960. And um, you uh, you went to DePaul University or is it DePaul College or DePaul University? DePaul University. All university. Okay. Um, and then you were able to pursue your, your passion for, for sports and, um, and uh, serve in several different capacities for the professional organizations, more, uh, primarily the Chicago White Sox, uh, the Houston Oilers, and the Chicago Bulls. Um, so I want to tie all these things together. Um, and I guess with the best place to, to start is probably uh, your early life. Um, I, and to, to cue everybody up real quick, we're going to be referencing a, a Brendan uh, he's the guy behind the scenes, uh, so we may be asking him to uh, pull up some information as we present. Uh, but I want to start with our first slide. Brendan, if you could pull up the first slide here. We've got some cool photos that I want to get Mr. McClure's feedback on. So slide number one. That's coming up in just one second. I had to refresh it. Sorry. No problem. No problem. So I guess, I guess while we're waiting for that, Mike, um, why don't you tell us where you're from uh, originally and uh, a little bit about your early history. Well, I was born on the south side of Chicago and uh, grew up there. But uh, the story would not be replete if I didn't mention that basically my family's from Indiana, down around Lafayette, Indiana. And uh, my sister and my late brother and I, I inherited a, a farm that's been in the family for 195 years. So we're hoping to make it to 200 years. She's a year or two older than I am, but uh, we're both hoping to go to the state fair where they honor people who are two century families uh the picture on the left that was a purdue jacket and a helmet back probably around uh when i was probably about six or seven years old i think the right side picture is really kind of uh, ironic because my team in baseball was the white Sox. now i said i grew up on the south side but right. i grew up a cub fan i was a cub fan for 39 years until i went to work for the white Sox. But I was on the White Sox Little League baseball team. So I guess there was some destiny ordained there, preordained uh, in uh, my early beginnings with the Brainerd Beverly Little League. So, so, so here's my question. Okay, so first off, on the right with the baseball team, the White Sox, which one are you? I am uh, second row to the right. Second row to the right. First one? Uh, no, uh, the far right on the, on the second row. Gotcha. Okay, very good. Gotcha. And okay. I was, very cool. I was, I was a catcher. <laughs> so the brains of the operation, right? The catchers are well, always. Well, yeah, I, I found yeah. out you, you got to, you got to talk a lot more. Of course you could also <laughs> get in trouble with the umpire. I, I found that out early on, but uh, yeah, that was the position where supposedly, you know, you were exerting a little bit of leadership, but uh, it was a pretty good baseball in that particular neighborhood back in those days. In fact, when I, my 12 year old year, uh, I had the, uh, I spent a lot of summers up at a, a camp up near Muskegon, Michigan, and uh, I actually, because I had detected a slight heart murmur in my physical exam, I wasn't allowed to participate, but that uh, our 12-year-old team was one game away from getting to uh, Williamsport. Wow. And the, the, so the Little League World Series. That's correct. Wow. Wow. So when you sent over these photos, I immediately was drawn to them. And you sent me a great amount of photos. And unfortunately, we weren't able to get them all in to the presentation. But these two jumped out at me for two specific reasons. The one on the left, um, you know, from it just just the era of the photo and how you're dressed speaks uh, to the movie The Christmas Story. <laughs> I mean, 
Um, and then, I, you know, in the same vein, on the one on the right, uh, I'm reminded of the movie The Sandlot. Um, you know, the, the way the uniforms look, the, the way, you know, the, the, all the little, little guys on the team looked, it just reminded me of that, that movie in particular. And, and, uh, and a very, it was very neat to see, uh, to see those photos. So thank you for sharing those. Well, and I'm still close friends with a couple of the guys that are in that picture. So I've got a, a lot of people from grade schools that are 70 year friends. And, uh, the other thing on the picture last Saturday was Purdue's opening home game. But of course with COVID, we weren't able to have anybody in the stands, uh, it would have been my 74th year of going to live games at Ross Aid Stadium in West Lafayette. Now I won't be able to go uh, go this year because of the uh, the virus. But uh, that was uh, I went to my first Purdue Notre Dame game in 1947 in South Bend, and my dad was a classmate of John Wooden's at Purdue, and he was the water Is it boy. The John Wooden? Pardon? The John Wooden. The John Wooden. Yes. The wow. John Wooden, who was a All-American at Purdue and then went on to become a legendary coach at UCLA. Right. Wow. So, so I have to ask you, um, growing up on the south side of Chicago, um, I, I assume in a predominantly Irish Catholic neighborhood, how, how was it being a Purdue fan uh, in that environment and not being a Notre Dame fan? Well, it was pretty good because I'll tell you what. The first game I really remember, my parents went to the game in South Bend. It's 1950. And I'm in my backyard, and I've got the radio turned on real loud so I could hear it out the kitchen window. Mm -hmm. And it was Joe Boland who was the broadcaster for the Notre Dame Network, football network. Sure. That was a day that Purdue shocked the world. They broke Notre Dame and Frank Leahy's 39-game winning streak. And a quarterback from Chicago, uh, Lynn Bloom High School, Dale Samuels, a good friend of mine who lives in uh, Waukesha today, no kidding. Uh, Dale Samuels was the quarterback of that Purdue team that won 28 to 14. And after that, for the next 20 years, uh, anybody who grew up in that era knows that Purdue was a consistent Notre Dame killer because uh, Jack Molenkoff, who coached Purdue for 15 years, uh, had a record of 14, 10 and one against the Irish. 14, wow. four and one. I'm sorry. 14, four, no, 10, four and one, 10, four and one. Wow. Um, I want to I want to get into the, to, you know, kind of roll into St. John's, but I, I think there's kind of a a little bit of a setup um, in regards to your personal history as to to why and, and the path to St. John's um, specifically um, uh, your mother, your father, um, your brother, um, all that. So I just I just want to I think, you know, where I'm going with these questions. Sure, just, I do. And yeah. uh, of course, as we as we know, even back then, and, and certainly to this day, if you went to military school, the first thing anybody else thought who knew nothing about it would say, well, what did you do wrong? <laughs> right. uh, in, in, in my case, I came from a family of, I guess, we, later on, we became known somewhat as the motherless children. My father's mother died when he was 11. My brother's mother died in child's birth, uh, and he went to St. John's class of 54. Uh, I, my dad remarried, my mother died three months after I was born. And so there was this history in the family of mothers dying very early on. Well, my dad did remarry after eight years. We had a housekeeper who raised me for the first eight years, but then, uh, he remarried, but my brother went off to St. John's in 1954 and he was having difficulty in a public school. And that, and so that was one of the primary reasons why my dad sent him to St. John's where he immediately uh, rounded into shape, as, as we would say, and was a model cadet, uh, graduated in the class of 54. And unfortunately, I lost him two years ago when he passed away. But uh, uh, he was, uh, we, we were extremely close. We were raised together. And while he was six years older than me, he more or less took care of me. And then toward the end of his life, I took care of him. Yeah. Um... Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing and being open with uh, with that. So so as so as I understood it, your brother was there, kind of paved the way and introduced you to St. John's. But you you wanted to go to St. John's. I wanted to go. In fact, I was probably the only person that cried at the graduation of the class of 54 because I thought that was the end of the time that I would be able to get up there. We used to go up there. And if there's anybody watching who's from my era, he knows that there was a place called the Oakton Manor, which was pretty snazzy for its time because it had an indoor swimming pool. It was kind of a nightclub and it was located over on Lake Pewaukee, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so we would go up there and stay at Oakton Manor and we'd go over and see my brother. And then I'll never forget uh, his graduation when they had the uh, 
the military drills and they had the uh, uh, 50 caliber machine guns uh, out on the on the on the golf course and it was and and they had planes the uh, Herbie Trapp's uh, pilots uh, from the flying club were going over dropping uh, flower bags and bombs. <laughs> oh, I remember that. Yeah, to this day, I can that still stands out of my mind. But yeah, so that that and then when I finally went. Uh, I would not have prospered the way I did at St. John's if I'd gone to a public school because I started out at a school with 2,000 students. I mm-hmm. would not have played football. I would have not gotten as involved in activities. And so it was really a blessing to go to a smaller school. And, uh, you know, I, I thrived at St. John's. So, so, Brendan, if I can cue you, I'm going to ask you to go towards the back of the slides um, I, real quick. Uh, you had mentioned uh, Coach Trapp. Um, I've got a couple of pictures, Mike, in our, in our conversation. So this would be the second to last one. I think it's 13. Um, and everyone's getting a little bit of a preview here of uh, what we're going to showcase. But, uh, yeah, so there's there's a couple of inf- people that you defined as influential. Um, and so I just, if you, you know, take some time to talk about these three individuals. There we go. Perfect. Well, absolutely. The the first one was certainly influential on all of our lives if we were in school while he was still serving as president, and that was Roy F. Ferrand. And in my brother's life, he was significant, as I mentioned to you as we were discussing it. Uh, everybody remembers you either played in athletics or you had intramurals in the afternoon after classes and before we went to dinner. My brother ch- chose to go to the general, who was an avid fisherman, mm-hmm and ask him if he could go over and help out at the Wisconsin State Fish Hatchery, which was located very close to campus, right over behind the golf course. Right. And so he would go over there, and he spent his two years of time and activities working at the fish hatchery, and later was interested, and he went to Colorado State University, and he was interested in going into uh, conservation and wildlife preservation and things like that. That's not where he ended up, and the funny thing is, Given the fact he was at St. John's, he later became a private pilot and was uh, part owner of a Lafayette uh, uh, Aviation here at uh, Purdue and also was their chief pilot. So uh, he uh, he did two years there. And, of course, General Farron, the thing I think anybody who remembers, every day he would walk over to the gym where the barbershop was located and get a shave. And, you know, it was remarkable to walk through there and uh, – see him and uh of course the other thing i remember about him was at the football games he never sat down he either mm-hmm. was walking or he'd get down on one knee with his swagger stick and watch every minute of every game he was a great great fan of all the uh, athletics at st john's but i think a particular fan of football wow dean david firkey yeah he, he was my savior i How's- as i told you uh, mm-hmm. I was not very good in algebra. So my freshman year, I was in algebra one. And after about five weeks, I was doing very well in every other of my academics, but I was not doing well in algebra. So Dean Firkey called up my dad and he said, uh, I think maybe it would be good if we put him into a, something else and then he could go back and retrace to algebra maybe next year or the year after. So they select, they sat down and asked me what I thought I would like. And I selected a a speech class, a speech class that was primarily all seniors taking a class, at the, an elective more or less, that they could take as a slough course in their last year at school. And there were people like Francis George, who was a football defensive lineman and offensive tack, uh, tackle or guard. And, you know, it was, it was intimidating enough to be a freshman around seniors, but it was even more so in a speech class. Where, but uh, I did get through the class okay. And so... I took geometry my second year from uh, Lieutenant Devenald, great football coach at, at St. John's and a, certainly one of our fine alumni. And then our, my third year, they put me back into algebra. And sure enough, after about five or six weeks, Dave Firkey called me, called my father up, and he says, you know, he's just not doing well in algebra. I think we ought to look at something else. So I took an advanced speech class. <laughs> So not surprisingly, to those of you who may have been in school with me, I ended up uh, majoring in speech at DePaul University. I had a double major speech in history, 
But uh, so I guess, you know, that kind of got me steered in the right direction when I got in that speech class my freshman year at St. John's. Herbie Trapp, what a great guy and a great coach and an inspiration to all of those who were at St. John's while he was teaching and coaching. My freshman year, I thought I was a pretty decent football player. I had played some grammar school football, and so I went out for football. And uh, as a freshman, the first game came along. I believe the first game was uh, uh, either at Oconomowoc or uh, – uh, I can't really remember which, which town it was, but anyway, I didn't make the traveling squad and I was crushed. Mm -hmm. Now I was kind of shy at that particular, particular point in my life. And that one was very assertive, but that day, the next day I went out to football practice, I walked over really intimidated, but I felt like I had to say my case. And so I went up to uh, captain trap and I said, a uh, captain co or coach, I said, I'd like to know why I wasn't uh, picked to go on the travel squad for the game. And he looked at me and he called me Mac. And he said, Mac, he said, you just didn't show me anything. You're not aggressive out there. You're, you, you're going to have to do something to, to earn your way onto the travel squad. And so that same afternoon at practice, on two occasions defensively, I broke through. And I'll never forget because I saw him a couple years ago at a reunion but there was a guy named John Mueller who was in a class ahead of me, mm -hmm. and John Mueller was playing running back, and I broke through, and both times I tackled him. Now, you know, he wasn't Charlie C., and he wasn't uh, uh, Eric Chrisman, but, uh, you know, he was still, still a guy I tackled, and Herbie was impressed. And so the next game, which was at Lake Mills, it was a night game, mm -hmm. I'll never forget because not only did I make the travel squad, but I started in the game. And I started on the Frost Soft team my freshman year and my sophomore year. And we'll go lead into our junior year later on. But what what Herbie taught me that afternoon is if you want something, you got to go get it. You can't just sit back and lay in the weeds. And so he taught me a very valuable lesson, and I never forgot it. Is that, I mean, is that something that you've used or that, that mentality or that approach you've used? Uh, is that led to some of your successes later in life? Well, I think it becomes somewhat. It, it became somewhat a natural part of the way I look. I approach things, mm -hmm. and that was that you know you you had to go out and you had to, you had to excel. You had to go out and achieve. You had to go out and be creative. Come up with good ideas. Be innovative, and so I tried to incorporate that into everything I did. Uh, once I started my professional career, which uh, you know for the first five or six years had nothing to do with sports, but Right. That's another part of the story. Right. So, Brendan, while while we're talking here, why don't we uh, why don't we head back? Uh, is there anything on the the, the pictures that um, we have you in your Letterman sweater or the the car photo that you wanted to comment on before we moved on to the next? The only thing about the car, and I when I first mentioned it to you the night, I forgot his name, but one of the the ironies, and I think it shows, you know, six degrees of separation. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many others have had this, but my life has been full of finding experiences where no, mer no matter where I have been, I have found that in a world of six or seven billion people, it's a lot smaller than we really think it is. The car that I was in front of at uh, St. John's belonged to a guy by the name of Steve Grogan, who was uh, a lieutenant in the Air Force and who was our band company, bandmaster and faculty guy the first two years I was in school. And Steve Grogan, and I didn't even know it at the time, and it wouldn't have meant anything to me if I did. Steve Grogan was a, a graduate of DePaul University. Uh, I never had a chance to talk to him after uh, we left St. John's, but I think he went out and li was living in Hawaii later on in life and has since passed away. But uh, that was one of the ironies. Of course, the picture on the left, that's my father. And I think we meant maybe you've got that picture from later on with Chuck, but yeah. Uh, when we when we get to that one, I'll I'll bring him into the picture more prominently than I, I did right now. OK, um, so before we jump to your, your college time, which is the next slide, you did not finish at St. John's. No, I did not. You know uh, what happened? What what happened is I learned something I've tried to impress upon my grandchildren and my children and anybody else. You know, we do some pretty damn stupid things when we're 17 or 18 years old. And uh, that particular year, uh, 
I've got a pic. I, I went and found the yearbook and I got the picture. In the 1959 yearbook, there's a picture in the football section, and it shows. You probably can't see it very well, but it, it shows me up against the fence. This is the picture right here, and, and I'm up against the fence. Okay. And, oh, you don't have me? Yeah, I guess you do. Yeah, Brenda, can you Anyway, take... I'm up against the fence in the 1959 yearbook. Now, they used to give us lemons to suck on, so that might have accounted somewhat for the sour look. But the other part of my sour look was that <laughs> that year we were not very good in football. And we were playing Culver, and we lost to Culver 40 to nothing. The only playing time I got as the third end. The third end. Not third string, but the third end. The only playing time I got was on a kickoff in the Culver game, uh, receiving, not kicking, because we lost 40 to nothing. Right, right. Uh, but receiving when the score was 40 to nothing. I think it was on the field for about eight seconds. So, you know, Pat Dillon was a fine coach and a good guy, but he certainly – but, of course, I had I had Corky Aller and Eric Christman in front of me. And mm-hmm. as long as we're going into the DePaul part of the story, I'll get to it in a second. But mm-hmm. So I was unhappy about my experience in football. And sure. so we had problems in band company that year. And mm-hmm. thirdly, in any 16- or 17-year-old guy at St. John's who had a problem when he's a junior or senior, it was probably an affair of the heart. And, yes, it was in my case, too. I'd had a summer romance with a with a girl I met on a canoe trip up on the on the Pine River in northern Michigan, mm-hmm. and uh, I found up until that point, I mean, I hadn't had any reason to, to wonder about the opposite sex my first three years at school, but that year, <laughs> so there were three things, and then she sent me a dear John letter uh, in the, right after Thanksgiving, so that that added to my uh, so disappointment, cold. <laughs> my unhappiness. But to make a long story short. You know, I used some bad judgment and decided that I was going to go home. I went to a private school when I went home. In fact, it was the first year of a non-military for Morgan Park Military Academy, which has is still ex- in existence as Morgan Park Academy. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, I t- and in the General Ferrand in his summer letter, without mentioning my name, made note of that fact and made note of the fact that I'd come there with bad grades. I'd gotten on the honor roll. I had been in a position where I was going to be an officer my senior year. And for some reason, he was surprised that he'd received a letter requesting my transcripts to transfer to a school that he had respect for and had known for many, many years as a as a a peer group, a peer school. But uh, anyway, uh, as I look back on it years later, I realized what a mistake I had made, because once again, it was a lesson learned. Right. The lesson learned that you always finish what you start. And in, in that particular case, I didn't. So uh, uh, I think everything that we go through in our lives is a learning experience. And I've mentioned a couple of them in the case of, uh, of Herbie Trapp and the football team and in the case of my decision to leave St. John's. And ironically, I went to Morgan Park Academy, started, played both ways, and played every minute of every game during an eight-game season, closing my season – closing my season at a school with 130 students against your alma mater, Notre Dame of Niles, which <laughs> was a beginning school three years earlier. And by the time we played them, they had they had about 100 guys on their football team. <laughs> <laughs> and we won a moral victory in a 30-13 to 13 defeat uh, on a muddy, muddy night out in uh, Niles. But uh, I was interested when you and I got to talking about the fact that was – and their their coach that year was a guy by the name of Joe Yanto, who later on was on the Era Parsegian staff at Notre Dame and uh, was very very well known in, in college football assistant coaching circles. Yeah, 